Morning, everybody. How are we doing today? It's a rainy Saturday here in the upper Midwest in the United States of America. 2021. Today I want to reiterate something I've discussed a couple times on my channel over the last two years. But I feel like I want to express it once again. And I'm, I'm a student of history. I love anthropology and the study of cultures and people. I'm a big fan of the diaspora of the human experience across the planet and how linked I am to all of it. You know, I feel as much uh, Aborigine Australia as an ancient Chinese, as an ancient Egyptian. This is my lineage, my heritage is us. And nationalism has such a small scope. It's such a small slice of reality. <clears throat> and I've often just told my friends and my children, the opposite of the society you're born into is the reality of all things. Society is but a slice of how things are done, one way of doing things. Reality is everything that's ever been and ever will be. It's far more encompassing. It's far more empowering. It gives license to live outside the parameters of the culture that you're a part of. And thank goodness, because I would have a hard time being too stuck in the culture that I live in. <clears throat> I'm connected to all things before, and I'm curious about all things that will be. <clears throat> and often when I discuss jazz, there's an importance to the black manifestation of this art form. It's not just about skin color. It's about that experience and that history and how they interweave to tell this narrative. And if we don't accept the history, if we don't accept the understanding of why it's sacred and why when a black man does this music, it has a special power, we're missing the mythology. Uh, something I've realized recently, the people who have the most philosophical differences with me in this channel, I've often wondered who they were because why are you listening to this black music if you're such a de 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 degenerator of the black tradition and, and all they accomplish? And it's clear to me now that the people who have negative things to say about me expressing the power of the black experience through this music are jazz fans via the audiophile experience. Many audiophile people think of jazz as a great barometer for how their system sounds. And I think it's those people who come from a bourgeoisie kind of experience and are all about their $10,000 amps and preamps and speakers that listen to jazz because it's so sophisticated. Listen to how my speakers sound. When they hear me talk about the blackness of it, the, the pain and the sorrow, the suffering that created this art form, they don't want to hear that. It, it makes them feel something that they don't like. So now I know who those people are at least. You're welcome to the channel, of course, and I hope you listen to what I have to say. But if you don't accept the power of this black expression, you're missing the entire mythos. This music was born out of a necessity for safety, for a place where we could go for shelter. And I'm going to use the analogy I've used several times, but I think it's such an apt way to understand it. The African shaman who carved that mask in the jungle hundreds of years ago didn't carve it to be the most amazing carver of all time. Look at how intricate my carvings are. I'm the best guitar player ever. Look at how sophisticated all my crazy skin. That's never what the whole thing was about. I carved this mass to be a protector, to protect my people, to protect myself from the sorrow, the pain, and the indignation of living this life as I was born into it. Jazz was a shield. It was something that these men picked up as an armor that not only helped themselves survive the everyday struggle of living in America, but to survive their people and give their people that same comfort and solace as well and that's such an amazing point that's the magic of the music it's not about sophisticated chord changes it's about fellowship and comfort 
and a place of joy and a place of coming together to shield us from all those evil spirits that want to oppress. And with the African mask men, those shaman who carved those masks, who did it just to protect the village, not to be a great carver. There was no sense of ego in that carving. It was a necessity out of love of people, self, and village. There's other people who still could carve masks. The white colonial people came, saw the masks, carved them in the marketplaces of Accra, Dakar, Yaoundé. They carved those masks themselves, brought them back to Europe. But those masks don't have the same magic as the mask carved by the shaman. The closest we can get to it are those guys like a Bill Evans or a Pepper Adams who go and live among the villagers and associate and break, wine, break bread and drink wine with the villagers and live among them for years. That guy could carve a mask. Bill Evans can tell you something. Pepper Adams has an expression that relates to the initial mass carvers, they have empathy, they can recognize that struggle. But if I live in the port city in my fancy bungalow and I'm carving a mask, it might be a more intricate mask, it might be a more profitable venture, I might have a thousand great masks for sale in my little beachfront stoop. They might be great masks with great painting, but they lack the magic. And even those masks made by the colonial conquerors 400 years ago that still might have some value but then there's masks being carved today as modern re replicas of the mask and they they retain very little value they're worth about 20 bucks at home goods that original shaman mask that's priceless it belongs in the museum it's a showpiece of a, of a per people finding shelter Art provides that. Art provides an outlet for my sorrow, my experience, and gives me a place to express how we feel and how, how much we need we have of this art form. This wasn't a choice. This was an obligation. I must be a protector. I must pick up my sword and my shield and through my little message of fire and sorrow and integrity, I will speak towards the cosmos for my people and protect my people. And jazz ventures away from that. You know, by the mid 60s, jazz has gotten very much away from speaking for its people. And a new form of spiritual jazz comes in, which I feel is often a little bit more programmed, planned. It's trying to be something instead of just being something. The real expression of those shaman, it's something that we need throughout time so we can understand that those who are the least among us have the most valuable things to say. I've been digging through a lot of great white jazz these last three, four months, discovering new labels from the West Coast. Uh, a lot of really fiery players that have a lot of great expression, talent, and ability. And yet, as I'm sitting there, it never tugs at my soul and, and makes me recognize and reveal, like, oh, man, that guy had some pain that he was getting off his chest right now. Some fear, some exhaustion, frustration. These guys are amazing players. But it never tugs at me quite the same way as these black musicians who, again, are doing it out of necessity. Uh, I want to show you a fun record here, Spontaneous Explorations by the great Earl Father Hines, who goes back to the 20s, played with Louis Armstrong, uh, was one of the leaders of the whole jazz movement in the 30s and 40s, had a lot of great bands, a lot of people played with Earl Hines, he's a legend. Uh, he kind of gets forgotten by today's collectors very much. Uh, he has a number of great records, one on Nocturne, which I'm going to talk about soon in my little special on the small L.A. labels. But this is on a label Bob Thiel founded, uh, who was associated with Impulse, 
primarily to most people. That's where you'll know Bob Thiel's name from. He started this label, Contact. I think there's only a half dozen titles or so. Uh, there's, a, there's a Coleman Hawkins I need to grab. Uh, this Earl Hines record, though, it's wonderful. It's Bob Thiel recognizing the importance of some of these old cats. It's got the same kind of deluxe gatefold as an impulse would. It's, uh, again, Father Hines does do a session and impulse. So I'm guessing there was, there was kind of a connection there. Uh, oh, you want to do a record for my little label as well? And these guys probably were always willing to do so. It's a nice piece. Like I said, the packaging is really nice. Probably from 1962. Contact. Only a half dozen titles or so. I label that. I'm going to grab a few more pieces as I find them, as I see them. I'm not going to go and search them out. I'll wait for them to come to me. Uh, a lot of times there's things like that where... I don't go out and look for it on Discogs or eBay, but if I'm in a seller's store and buying a few things, I'll see what else I got. I'm like, oh, that's something I want to fill in. I want to fill that in. So that's one of those those labels where I'm just going to fill it in as I find them. They're uh, mostly guys from the earlier era that feels trying to give some exposure to. And Father Hines is a guy you should definitely uh, recognize his brilliance. And he's a mass carver. Armstrong was one of the greatest mass carvers ever and in spite of his virtuosity in spite of his kind of boisterous almost bravado nothing he does feels ego driven or unnecessary it's not just notes for the sake of notes or sophistication for the sake of modernity he plays from his soul West End Blues wasn't a guy showing you time signatures being adjusted on the fly. It was a guy simply going, that's how I feel right now. This is my vocabulary. It's coming out. And the honest spilling of that expression and experience, it dumbfounded the music world. Uh, how can he compose something that brilliant? It's because it wasn't composed. It was improvised. The most integral prayers aren't something you sit down <clears throat> and have to compose and think of what you need to say to your creator. The most important prayers are the ones that come from a place of, oh, creator, I need your help right now. Help me to survive this. And it comes up from a place of honesty. And so that whole thing is trying to get people some way to grasp the difference between white jazz and black jazz. White jazz can be equally proficient, if not more so. It sold better, had better production, had better studios, had better tours, uh, more places where they could play. Whites owned jazz for a long time. <clears throat> but every one of them would tell you it was a black music. Every one of them was honored to play with the black men when they had the chance to, even though America shunned that and really was uncomfortable with that. But the white musicians knew. And even guys like Jerry Mulligan and Jimmy Joffrey who started becoming some of the highlights, the all-stars of jazz, and were dominating the chart writing and the composition and the innovation and developments of jazz in the mid-50s, and impacted the black players. Make no mistake about it, those guys were impacting the black musicians. But those, those Mulligan and Joffrey and all those white cats would be the first to tell you, this is a black music, a black art form. And when a black person plays, they're not trying to be innovative or sophisticated. Parker never sat down and be like, I'm going to reinvent the music. <clears throat> he was just playing from his soul. And what came out was something so new and fresh, so innovative, just like Armstrong. Those innovations come in natural bursts of inspiration and expression through this medium of my condition it's not something you can plan you have to just mold the clay as you go and that's the importance of the mask the original shaman who made that art it was sacred it was not about ego and how great am I it's about how good of a protector can I be for me and my people that's a very different motivation to play. And 
sometimes you don't even recognize the fact that you've become a shaman. You've just become the spiritual person who's leading their people through the wilderness. And you've found something that allows them to feel inspired to follow you. And thus you become the medicine man. You become the shaman. I don't think Armstrong set out to lead his people, but by being that torchbearer, that inspiration, that ambassador, you become a shaman. And that's something the white jazz player can never quite embody. Our, our condition, our experience is too different. And like I said, a guy like Pepper Adams or Bill Evans who lived among the villagers can really get close and make a mask that's of great value. And even those original colonial guys who settled on the ports and capitalized on this new industry and made, made masks that they sold in the markets that were wonderful masks. The Joffreys, the Mulligans, the Chet Bakers, those guys made great music. But there's a reason why their records go for 20, 30, 40, 100 bucks. And a sacred Hank Mulvey record goes for 6,000 or more. There's a reason why the black LPs are becoming so rare and so valuable. And part of it's supply and demand. There wasn't a lot of them sold compared to the white guys. But again, that's all that history is interwoven to have created that. So we should celebrate this music and understand that it's never diminishing the white players by acknowledging the blackness and the experience and the importance of what they brought to this art form when they created it <clears throat> as a way to protect their village. And I, as a white guy, I could protect my village too. I could carve a heck of a mask. But I gotta acknowledge that those guys, they really pushed that envelope. They created this space for with, with, which you know, I can crawl into and also free myself from some of the demons. And so there's lots of great jazz to be made. All of it has value and merit on different levels. And if you love 70s prog rock jazz art, that's great. But it doesn't diminish the fact that the most important jazz is that black music from the first 40, 50 years. And it's also important to recognize that that message of the shaman, that, protect, that protection, as the generations change, so does the carrier of that magic. That potent mythology shifts into soul R&B because that becomes the protector of the people. Otis Redding, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, Al Green, Barry White, those guys took over that mantle. Curtis Mayfield, that reached the masses and protected and gave them shelter. And even verbally started to speak some of these things and speak up against a lot of the injustice. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On is a masterpiece of social ramification, upheaval, and power done in such a soulful, beautiful way, you almost miss its potency. Talking Book, Inner Vision, Songs in the Key of Life, those records aren't just story fairy tales. This is potent stuff that's a direct lineage to the mass making of the jazz era. And then hip hop takes that mantle from R&B. As R&B goes its different directions and loses its potency, hip hop takes that mantle. And those early hip hop MCs start carrying that same message. Where's that magic potency now? That's a good question. Because hip hop's obviously become so entrenched into the core trunk of pop music. That guys like Kanye West make records that are as much pop as they are black music. I'm not sure. It seems as though our televised consumer-based culture has assimilated and reduced the power of the art. They've taken it from the artist and made it so you can only consume this mass-produced pablum that's selling you shoes, wristwatches, and cars while they do it. And that's a shame. So jazz is powerful. Jazz is mythological. And we should never escape or forget the mythos. Because it's where the power comes from. It's the source of its energy. And when you hear those great 
Johnny Hodge's record with Ellington, all, all those great band members, all those great jam sessions on Norgrand and Verve, a lot of the blowing sessions at Prestige. The rawness and honesty of those records is what makes them outstanding. It's not in any way premeditated. It's completely off the cuff. And again, that type of prayer, that type of intercession is the most honest form of prayer. And that's the powerful stuff. That's what creates a link to the creator. And that, and that brings that power to the art to make it magical, to allow it to protect the village. I maybe get a little deep and philosophical for some of you, but I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have already heard me speak on this before. But I think it's important to recognize that this is an important aspect of this time in history and how the future will view this art form in centuries to come will echo what I am saying now. It's a valuable thing. It's a powerful message. It's, it's something that will always retain its power. As powerful as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Marvin Gaye's Mercy, Mercy Me, the ecology will be on people's walls a thousand years from now. This music has power because those who are oppressed can speak on what freedom means. And there's a lot of people in this world that will always feel the powers of oppression that will consume that art and make it protect them. And a lot of us can only take that message through a white performer so we don't have to recognize the atrocities and the, and the history that's linked to it. And if you're one of those audiophile guys who probably stopped listening a long time ago, that's only here for the speakers and the amplifiers and jazz, sounds so good through my system. A lot of pain's coming through your system, brother. Just because you ain't hearing it, just because you don't know the history or don't want to recognize it, don't act like your white privilege isn't a thing. Because it is. They don't have the same two legs to stand on. And saying, oh, my, my ancestors came here with $2 in their pocket ain't the same as saying my ancestors came here in chains and were enslaved for centuries and were tortured, brutalized, murdered, incarcerated, drugged, oppressed, impoverished. It's not the same. Because you and all your white privilege, even in poverty, can walk into any supermarket and not have half the eyes of the place look at you like. You don't know what it's feel, how it feels. You don't know what it's like. You don't know how many fewer opportunities there are. How many obstacles there are to overcome in order for the average black child to lead a healthy life. There's a lot more pitfalls still today. I need to say this stuff once in a while, because it's partly why this channel exists. To acknowledge what I recognize DJing is the magic power. Being raised in the church by Pentecostal parents, holy rollers, seeing the church and understanding how a lot of this Old Testament and how there is a safety and a shelter in what they believed. And they wrote things like the Psalms to find medication for their sorrow. I saw that in the black community when I went there, the sense of fellowship, the sense of communion, and how this music was biblical in its context. And it made jazz come to life for me. Because it meant that they were saying the same things in this era, just without words. And words fall short often expressing what I need to say. But me pouring my soul into a saxophone, there's no shortage of honesty in that. And the moment you recognize that, I'm hearing the most honest expression of a black male in America in 1953 that I possibly can hear, maybe that's when my ears will open up and I can actually hear what that experience is like. And it's one filled with oppression and equal parts optimism. There's a will to survive. There's a will to overcome. There's a will to forgive. Which is the funny thing is that there's more lack of forgiveness from the white oppressor than there is from the black oppressed. The black people want, for the most part, want to move on. They don't go out doing anti-white things. It's white crazy motherfuckers who go out and do anti-black things. That's insane. 
It's insane. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Check out anything you can find on this contact label. It's a cool little label. Like I said, I'm going to have to find some more of it myself. you got to love Earl Father Hines. He's an important institution and deserves lots of recognition. Y'all be safe. Have a great day. Peace.